have uh, in store today. So with that, we'll go ahead and um, pass the baton over to Mark Greenberg. And he's going to take it forward from there. Actually, Peter's going to be going from right here, but I'll be chiming on, chiming in okay. as necessary. Great. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Mark. So over the next minute or two, I'm going to go over the rules briefly. And then we're going to draw to see which team is going to go first. And then we'll announce the judges and we'll let the two teams that are not going to be presenting right away go ahead and go to their breakout rooms. So to start with, this competition, as you know, is made up of two parts, a report and a presentation. Both of those are equally weighted. So 50% of the presentation or 50% of the total score will be tonight from the presentation. Each team completed a research report and it was graded by five graders. Those scores are already in and our scorekeepers have that and they'll be compiling that along with the presentation scores tonight. So at the end of the evening, everybody will know who the winners are of this competition. Today, each one of those teams is going to do a 10 minute presentation followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. The 10 minute presentation will be monitored by our timekeeper, Mark, and he will give a one minute warning. And then at the 10 minute mark, he will announce that the time is up and he'll ask everybody to stop presenting. He'll do that for both the 10 minute presentation portion, as well as the 10 minute judges Q&A portion. So with that said, we have three teams. They are UCCS, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, University of Colorado Boulder, and University of Denver. So we're pleased to have all three teams today, and we look forward to seeing how this is going, how the order is going to go. We're going to draw, I'm actually going to draw from three pieces of paper, and I'll shuffle those, and then we'll see which team is going to go first. I'll announce the first, second, and third. So all the teams will have a chance to take a few minutes, gather themselves while I announce who the judges are, introduce the judges, and then the two teams that are not going will get a chance to uh, go into their breakout rooms. So our first team is UCB. Team one is UCB, University of Colorado Boulder. Team two, DU. DU will go second. And the last team has the most chance to take, stay in the breakout room and prepare is UCCS. So let's go ahead and announce who the judges are. And judges, I'm going to spotlight you if we can. Um, at least go ahead and take yourself off mute, all five judges or all four judges, excuse me. Sure. And I'm gonna start with Ken Goldman. Ken, can you wave your hand? And take your All right, now I'm off mute. I'm all Ken right. Goldman, I'm a friend of Mark Greenberg's who asked me to join in last week. And uh, I'm retired, used to run a small hedge fund in Denver that was focused on media and communications entertainment companies. And before that, that was a 16 year gig. Before that, I worked as a sell side analyst at, in New York at Bear Stearns and in Denver at the regional firm named Hanif and Imhoff. I did that for about six years. So that's my experience. Glad to Thank do this. Again. The next judge is Allison Tandy. Allison, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Allison Tandy. I work for the state of Colorado, Colorado Para. I've been with Colorado Para for about five years. Previous to that, I was in San Francisco and I've been in the buy side investment community for about 13 years. Thank you, Allison. Our third judge is Derek Angul Angulum, excuse me, Angulum. And let me go ahead and let you say your name again the proper way. I like how you said it. It sounds great. <laughs> there, it's Angulum. And um, so I, I, uh, I was on the buy side for, for 20 years. I worked uh, at Denver Investment, uh, Denver Investment Advisors, as some of you may know it, and uh, Siegel, Bryant, and Hamill. And I actually left there last year, and I'm actually in the, the 
angel investing venture capital uh, community uh, here in town. Thank you so much, Derek. And our last judge is Peter Quinn. Buddy, um, my name is Peter Quinn. I'm actually uh, president of CFA Society Colorado. So this uh, is something that I'm always very happy to be involved with. Uh, professionally, I worked as a fixed income analyst in the consumer space actually for about six years and then moved to the equity side where I covered equities in this space for about 10 years. Now I own an RA, an investment advisory firm in Denver. And um, there you go. So good luck, everybody. Thank you very much, Peter. Now in a minute, Chelsea is going to send the two teams that are not presenting first to the breakout rooms. So she'll send DU and UCCS to the breakout rooms. The advisors can go to that breakout room as well but the advisors will have the opportunity to come back and join the main room if they want to at any time. So they're welcome to uh, watch the entire presentation. Uh, they just will not share any information with either DU or UCCS. And the students will be in that breakout room. Uh, if for some reason you do accidentally um, get into the main room, Chelsea will immediately return you back to that breakout room. But if you can try to avoid hitting that room that breakout room exit button during the course of this presentation. So we're gonna start off and the first presentation will start in about uh, two to five minutes. And then that first presentation will take about 30 minutes. So we can count on the first part being from about 4.45 to 5.15. Second one, second team will go at around 5.15 to 5.45. And the third team will be at about 5.45 to 6.15. There'll be 10 minutes of the presentation, 10 minutes of a Q&A, and approximately 10 minutes for each of the judges to uh, compile their notes. And so we will let each breakout team come back a few minutes early uh, while the judges are still compiling their notes. Uh, but your, your, your choice as to uh, exactly what time you want to come back. We will let you know at, at, uh, at approximately that uh, with five minutes to go before your presentation time. All right, that's it for now. So let's go ahead and Chelsea will send the-, the oh, Wait, wait, Peter. Yes, sir. Um, does it, do any of the participants have any questions for us? No questions, anyone? Um, and I just wanna make sure everybody's clear. The teams that are um, that are not, that are not um, Boulder is number is the first team to present. The other two teams stay in your breakout rooms. You can communicate with each other, but of course you're honor bound not to get any information. If you've got any friends who are watching uh, somewhere else, um, no one is allowed to pass you any information about what somebody did in their presentation or what a question that might've been asked of one of the other teams. After a team presents, uh, Boulder, if you wanna stay and watch the other teams present, you're welcome to. And then DU, your number two, you can certainly stay and watch um, the third team present after you come in as number two. So you are allowed to watch after you've been in there. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. And let me go ahead and just briefly for our guests, let them know that after the three teams have gone, the judges will be stepping Away to their breakout room, but we're going to do a panel uh, with a advisor or a mentor from each one of the three schools. And we're going to be talking about what the research challenge means to them as a school and what it means to the students. So it's a, it's a fun panel, a nice time to unwind a little bit and hear what the research challenge uh, has done in the lives of, of, the, of the universities. And at that point, after we'll do that, we'll give our do our awards presentation. And, and wrap it up for the evening. Chelsea, do you wanna go ahead and send the, both DU and UCCS to the breakout rooms? Those breakout rooms are open. You should have gotten a notification. Go ahead and head over there. All right, it looks like everybody is in their breakout rooms. And then Chelsea, can you um, hide the um, 
the pictures, the screens for everyone except for the Boulder team and the judges and me, please. So I actually can't, the best way I can recommend for that is whoever will be sharing their screen um, and whoever is presenting and the judges, please have your videos on. And then those of us that don't, um, that aren't presenting or aren't judges, have your videos off please. And that'll make sure that we're not viewable. Okay. Do you, you'll be able to, I'm sorry, uh, UCB, you'll be able to start when you're ready. And Give us about two minutes. Um, I've got to go grab my phone for my, uh, for the timer. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, take a minute. If you don't mind, if I get the, just a thumbs up from Wubak and Christian that we're ready to party. And you can all go off mute as well, Wubak and Christian, at your convenience. I see three CU Boulder participants. Is it supposed to be five? And there's three to five for each team. Oh, okay. So it's three here. Okay. Our fourth member, unfortunately, won't be with us tonight. Mm -hmm. If you guys also want to test to make sure that you're able to screen share, if you're comfortable with that, go for it, too. Uh, how does that look? Looks good. Perfect. <laughs> there we go. Rocking and rolling. Party on, Garth. So at the one minute mark, um, I'm going to hold, as timekeeper, I'm going to hold up a sheet like this and wave it uh, for all everybody, uh, all the buffs presenting. And that will tell you you've got one minute left of your 10 minutes. And then for q and I will again hold up a white card and wave it back and forth so you know you have one minute left. And then I will stop people from talking right at the 10 minutes. So you can finish the sentence you're on but not maybe your complete thought. Awesome, thank you. And can we ask everybody who's not uh, presenting now to um, uh, close their video? Thank you, Van. Except for the judges. The judges Except for the start. judges and the students, yes. Judges, are you all ready? If anybody's not ready, let us know. And with that, uh, see you. If you're all ready, you can go ahead. Uh, as soon as you're ready, you can get started. All right, well, awesome, thank you. Hi, everyone, my name is Kyle Taylor. I'm from CU Boulder, along with Christian Kitchen, Wubek Koo, and our fourth team member, Frank Medina. He unfortunately can't be with us today. Our faculty advisor was Matt Fleming, and our industry advisor was Bradford Kirby, and we thank them for their patience. So, on to VF Corp. So, VFC, founded in 1899, is one of the world's largest apparel, footwear, and accessory companies, connecting people to lifestyles, activities, and experiences they share remote, cherish most through a family of iconic outdoor, active, and workwear brands. They're diversified across brands, product categories, channels of distribution, geographies, and consumer demographics. All their largest brands are Vans, the North Face, Timberland, Dickies, and the newly acquired Supreme. 
Their business depends on its ability to stimulate consumer demand for its brands and products. Their market is high quality and innovative goods at competitive prices with high service levels while maintaining its intellectual property. So they manage a portfolio of brands through frequent acquisition, acquisitions and divestitures. Uh, historically, they acquire brands that have significant potential and grows them rather than developing its own brands. They also downsize frequently and they're willing to drop brands that do not meet its expectations. The active management of its brand portfolio allows VFC to replace weak and less profitable brands with growth potential brands, enabling them to focus on its marketing, distribution, and innovation efforts for its highest return opportunities. So segments of VFC, it's predominantly broken up into three segments consisting of outdoor work and active. The outdoor segment have products uh, offer performance-based and outdoor apparel for customers. The North Face is the largest brand in the outdoor segment. Their products are marketed globally, primarily through specialty outdoor and premium sporting goods stores. Timberloom is the second largest brand in the outdoor segment, but many of the products combine performance benefits for style styling and share the experience of being marketed globally. Products in the work segment, they're designed for work and work-inspired lifestyle. Dickies is the largest brand in the work segment. It's leader in authentic, functional, durable, and uh, affordable workwear and has expanded to produce work inspired casual use products and products in the active segment. They offer active apparel, footwear, and accessories. Vans is the largest brand in the active segment, targets younger consumers that sit at the center of action sports, art, music, and fashion. I had Vans 15 years ago when I was in high school, and they're still cool now. So it says something. Distribution channels, they currently operate with multiple distribution channels from wholesale, direct to consumer, and generating most of the revenue. The other category includes licenses, agents, and distributors with 3,000 partnership stores, mostly in Europe and Asia. Licenses uh, account for less than 1% of total revenue, generally last three to five years with conditional renewal options, generating about four to 10% royalties. Uh, note, when looking at the uh, 2018 numbers for VFC, there's a change in the fiscal year date by the board of directors and revenue is not accurately reflected over a total year. So on to the industry overview. They operate in the apparel and footwear industry, serving as one of the largest companies in the lifestyle and activity segment. Industry profitability varies highly and can be affected by multiple factors, including manufacturing efficiencies, specialization, and brand name. Competition is relatively steep and the industry is susceptible to knockoff products. They've managed some of these risks by diversifying its supply chains. Um, its strengths include its brands, free cash flow. Uh, some weaknesses include its reliance on large customers with its top five customers, accounting for 16% of revenues. And opportunities include emerging markets, mostly in China, where it's focused and its main threat is their susceptibility to competitors and imitation products. And I'm gonna pass it off to Mr. Christian Kitchen. Great, thank you, Kyle. So in order to do our discounted cash flow analysis, we needed to do a comparable company analysis. And so as you see on your screen, we have 10 of VF Corp's biggest competitors. And so our main goal of this was we wanted to obtain a levered beta a capital structure and an enterprise value to EBITDA of VF Corporation. And now I will pass it off to Wubeck, who will walk you through that. Okay. We start with WEC calculation before deep into the DCF models. We set up the target capital structure to the mean of the comparable companies. The debt is 11% and the equity is 89%. Next, we set up the cost of debt to 2.1 from the most current report and multiply one minus marginal tax rate of 21% and got the after tax cost of that. And for the cost of equity, we use 10 year treasury note as a risk free rate and use January of 2021 implied ERP for a market risk premium. The lever beta is the average of the comparable companies. Get no such premium. The cost of equity is calculated as 8.2%. Combining all of this, the WAG is calculated as 7.5%. Before forecasting, we made adjustment for non-recurring items and recent events to the prior three-year period. Then we project the FCF for a period of five years. We project its top line on the basis of consensus estimate and held COX and SGNA constant at the prior historical year level of 45% and the 43% of the sales respectively. In the absence of projection for EBITDA, we simply held its margin constant throughout the projection period at prior historical yield level of 14%. To drive EBIT projection, we held DNA as a percentage of sales constant at the 2020 level of 2.5%. We also calculate tax expense for each year at its marginal tax rate of 21%. It was applied on an annual basis to EBIT to arrive at EBIT. We project the capex as a percentage of sales constant at the 2021 level of 3.1%. For the net working capital, we held the 2020 working capital ratio constant throughout the projection period. 
and each annual change in networking capital was added to the corresponding annual EBITDA to calculate annual free cash flow. Having determined all of the above line items, we calculate the annual project at free cash flow, which increased from $65 million to $730 million during the projection period. We use a media convention and discount the project annual free cash flow using the calculated WAC of 7.5%. Next. So we apply exit multiple method to determine terminal value. We multiply its terminal year EBITDA and the median of enterprise value to EBITDA trading multiple of the comparable company, which is 28 times. The enterprise value is comprised of 3.3 billion from the cumulative present value of free cash flow and 38 billion from the present value of the terminal value. Then we calculate the implied equity value of 37 billion by subtracting its net debt. Then we divide the implied equity value by its fully devoted share outstanding of 779 billion to determine an implied share price, which is $48.01. And we also apply perpetuity gross method. We calculate it as of 5.49% using the terminal year free cash flow of 1 billion and the calculate WAC and the terminal value. Then we calculate the present value of terminal value in the assumption that its terminal year EBITDA continually grew at 5.49%. We sum this and the cumulative present value of free cash flow to get the enterprise value of 72 billion. Lastly, we calculate an implied equity value of 68 billion, which is $88.13 per share. And I will pass on to the Christian. Great, thank you, Wubek. And so every company has risks. BF Corporation is not exempt from that. And one of its biggest goals is to expand into China. And that's a great opportunity, but with every opportunity comes a risk. And that includes fluctuations in the price of the yuan paired with geopolitical tensions between the US and China. Another one of their goals is to expand more into the digital and online space. With that comes the risk of being hacked and data leaks. So they'll have to invest more into their cybersecurity as well. Risk of acquisition, now they are a holding company, so they make most of their income from acquiring other companies. As you can see, they make most of their profits from their active space. So perhaps it would be wise for them to invest more in their other segments. Risk continued, COVID-19, everyone is talking about COVID-19 and so are we. As you can see in the second half of the year for quarters three and four, they had a decline in their revenue growth, and this was in part due to COVID-19, as well as their brick and mortar stores being affected by it. Foreign policy risk, they are a US company, however, they operate globally. And so they are subject to any regulations and tariffs imposed by the United States. And finally, the seasonal nature of the business, they make most of their money in the second half of the year. As you can see, COVID-19, hurt them last year in 2020. And if COVID-19 continues into 2021, they're gonna to have to find a way to continue their revenue growth. ESG, they have, they're highly ranked when it comes to ESG. They have inside management team regarding their sustainability and water usage. And if they have suppliers that aren't being sustainable, they will cut partnerships with them. They were ranked number one on Barron's most socially conscious list and women make up 50% of their entire workforce. And finally governance, they ensure that they have a diverse board of directors so that there is no imbalance of power and they make sure that shareholders are on the top of their minds by being transparent with all their moves. In conclusion, our recommendation on VF Corporation is long at a target price of 88.13. And we receive this through our perpetual growth method and we are long on it because of its high ESG standards, its diverse holding, its diverse holdings of many companies, and the industry has a lot of room to grow. Thank you, CFA Society, for putting this on for us. Go Buffs. Thank you. All right, and uh, now we will move to Q&A. And again, that's 10 minutes, and I will, again, hold up the white card when you have one minute left. Go ahead and get started. Well, the thing I noticed is the 5.49% perpetual growth rate in your DCF model. What gives you confidence that a company like VF can grow at 5.5% in perpetuity? It seems like it might be high, but I don't know. Yeah, I can answer that question. 
So based on our ca calculation, the perpetuity growth rate is 5.5%. And I think that's reasonable because that's a little over than industry average, which is industry average is around three to 4% YOI. I have a follow-up on that. And first thing I'll say is you guys did a really good job presenting. So kudos to you on the hard work. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So um, if, if you think the 5.5 is reasonable, I, I'd be curious to know how, um, I mean, obviously the market's taking a different view right now. So I, I'd be curious, what, why do you think the market's taking the view it is pricing or where it is? And what do you think would need to happen to have the market come to your view? Uh, of the stock. So we also use the, we also compare with the F consensus estimate and the consensus estimate the cater between 2021 and 2025 is around 11.8%. So I think our perpetuity growth rate is reasonable compared to the consensus estimate. Right, yeah, and I, I, I don't, doubt that I was more saying the stock price is reflecting a lower growth rate than that, right? It, otherwise, it wouldn't be trading where it is. So I was just curious, why do you think the market is pricing it where it is today? Um, so I think there's concerns definitely with the recession we're in, um, especially, I think we're a little bit more bullish in the fact that this isn't a supply driven recession, but a demand driven one with coronavirus. So the turn uh, we expect to be a lot quicker and faster, especially with the labor market. Great, thank you very much. Can I ask you a question about the WAC you're using? It looks like um, your debt, I think, was about 1.9% or below 2%, and you, the risk-free rate was also very low. If you think about a more normalized environment where rates are higher and your equity, the required return on equity returns to a more normalized rate, how does that impact your outlook for the stock? Oh, yeah. In the we, we are still kind of expect the interest rate is increasing for the future. And that increased the cost of debt and also increased the WAC. And when, so WAC can be between 8% 8 or 9%. So under that scenario, what would be your target price assuming a and more normalized WAC? And then, and then the target price will be lower about. Okay. 10 or I believe it can go down to 10 or 20% more depending on the market, how the participant think. Great, thank you. Seems that the uh, valuation is pretty rich for this stock, um, especially look, looking against other companies, maybe that are even more substantial, Nike comes to mind. What do you think justifies that higher uh, valuation for VF Corp? So I think the way that VF Corp mitigates its risks, especially through its manufacturing and supply chains is definitely one thing, uh, especially compared to a Nike, that it kind of helps us be confident in its stock. What would, what would that implied multiple be at, uh, at your DCF price target? What would the, do you know what the implied multiple would be and kind of how that compares to its history? Uh, can you repeat the question again? I can... Sure. So, so kind of piggybacking on Peter's question, um, if you if you'd say this if you say this should be trading at eighty eight dollars now, um, you're assuming a, a fairly high multiple, which mm -hmm. may which may be justified. I'm curious what that would look what that multiple would look like in comparison to how the company has traded over its history. Yeah, so for the XM multiple, we assume to be sold based on the valuation multiple on the market level. And that's our big assumption. My concern is inflation. <clears throat> we may be heading into, heading into a more inflationary environment with trends like onshoring and higher labor costs, higher commodity costs. How much have, did you look at that? Did you look at the inflation risk and how much that might impact? the company's margins going forward. 
uh, we, we didn't consider about the inflation when you built the model. So. Hmm. Can I ask a question about acquisitions? Um, it seems like they, you noted earlier in the presentation that they're trading in and out of different brands and it seems they've stepped up and made a fairly large acquisition with Supreme. Can you kind of walk us through the pros and cons of that deal and how you think about the 2.1 billion they paid for it? I think one of the biggest pros for that deal is Supreme operates primarily online. And so that's their way of venturing more into the digital space. It's also their way of investing more into the active brands. That's what's been driving their profits for the past year. And so they're going to continue to choose brands that are giving them the most profit. And the valuation of the transaction? So we didn't at 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 the we, we didn't at the point on our valuation because we really didn't know about the information of the supreme. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. One thing that stands out also at the app is they pay out a significant portion of their free cash flow as dividend, uh, more so than any of their competitors and. Um, it seems that management's made a conscious effort to support that dividend and grow that dividend. Do you think that's a proper use of their cash flow, or should they lower that dividend and uh, make more acquisitions? Or alternatively, should they raise the dividend and make fewer acquisitions? Uh, I believe it is reasonable because the cost of debt is really low. So it's reasonable to borrow money and then and then dis distribute the profit earning to the shareholders. And then, and then, and then we can also protect the share, uh, share price. Should they, should they, because the cost of debt is so low, yeah, very low, would they have a better return using that cash for acquisitions instead of a dividend? Mm, it could be. So they acquire the Supreme in November. Mm -hmm. I, I also think it's important that they keep up their dividends because I talk about how in ESG governance, they always keep the shareholders at the top of their mind. And that's one of their way that they keep their shareholders happy. Okay. What, what about the capital structure? You're, you know, they bought Supreme and temporarily took their leverage up to four times, I believe. I think they've been at three times. What do you think is the optimal capital, capital structure for a company like BF? So honestly, in the in the environment of increasing interest rate, they should reduce the debt level compared to equity. So what's the optimal? What, what do you think is the optimal leverage ratio for this type of company? Uh, we really didn't calculate about the ratio, like what should what could be the appropriate for the company. Okay. If I had to give a number off the top of my head, probably twenty five percent debt, seventy five percent equity. Hmm. Um, I'm curious if you guys had a chance, I, my understanding is that you talked with management, but I know you dug into, you know, a lot of the filings. Did you get a sense for what, um, for what in, uh, incentives were for management to understand, like how that might drive their capital allocation behavior? I think when talk with management, especially um, what I got out of it for trying to get free cash flow and everything is their desire to expand into foreign markets, especially with China, was kind of their number one driver. John, you're, you're on. You got to go on mute. What are you most worried about? Okay, guys, that's uh, um, that is ten minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, um, we will um, 
see you, Boulder. Thank you very much for your uh, good job. And uh, now judges, you had a chance to write up your notes and things like that. And then we'll be bringing um, Denver University into the room in um, a minute or two. Our we get a round of applause in. because we don't have a lot of people here, but let's give a quick round of applause for C. Boulder. Thank you very much. Our audience is not able to applaud for the moment but because uh, we have them all muted, but uh, we're going to have a 10 minute break. And during that time, the judges can take some notes, they can step away, they can even take the, their video off for a moment so they can step away. We're going to show a just a, a video on a loop so you can you'll know in about nine minutes we'll bring you back and once everybody's back again we'll start with the the next team for du so chelsea will we'll start that video in just a couple of minutes thank you for your time yes thank you When this competition came up, I thought that this would be the best testing ground to see if I'm cut out for it or if it's something that I'd like to pursue in the future. It's a great opportunity to reveal uh, additional skills and to improve uh, the knowledge of financial analysis. And the best way to learn how to do is to do it, even uh, if you do not know how to do it. It's a great learning experience that you can't get hardly anywhere else. I encourage anyone to do it who wants to be serious in their career in finance. We learn a lot of things in the classroom, and this was a great opportunity to be able to apply them to real life situations. The most important thing is that we learn how to keep calm and go ahead. I think my memory would be networking with everyone. I can feel a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of long hours staying in school, so it is very challenging in terms of working. Apparently, it also gives us a chance to travel all over the world and visit places like this. No doubt the, the best thing we got out of this, and everyone knows this through their own personal experiences, but when you walk through fire with someone, we absolutely grinded to get the work we put into this done, and looking back, it's so satisfying. Uh, I mean, yeah. Friends for life, for sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The winner of the 2015 CFA Institute Research Challenge Global Final is Canisius College. I couldn't feel happier. I basically on cloud nine. We worked so hard. We all came together, and this is basically surreal. It's a surreal experience, and I couldn't even imagine it, to be completely honest. And I'm, I'm going to envy the, the people that are going to be here next year and, and do the same thing we did. So we're, we're thrilled and I, yeah, I can't even speak anymore. <laughs> if you have the chance to do it, it's a great learning experience. When we're looking to do recruiting and candidates put forward that they're a CFA charter holder or they're undertaking the examinations, it immediately makes you think that they're really focused on self-development. The energy and excitement of the CFA Institute Research Challenge is captured best by the students, mentors, judges, employers and sponsors who participate in this impressive global competition. The annual competition promotes ethics and best practices in equity research through mentoring and training in analysis and presentation. In front of a live audience, Teams present their analysis to a panel of investment industry experts after spending months preparing their reports with their mentors and advisors, sometimes meeting personally with the company leaders of the firms they analyze. Teams compete at three levels. Winners from each local level competition advance to the regional level to compete against teams in their region. 
The challenge culminates in a global final of the top four teams. For students, it's an extraordinary resume builder and chance to interact with a global community of their peers and industry leaders. Investment professionals volunteer as judges, graders, and mentors, promoting best practices and ethical decision-making. Corporations oh, promote ethics and education and receive unbiased opinions from students. To truly appreciate this thrilling series of events, join us for the world's most prestigious investment oh, research competition. The CFA Institute. I'm on the Zoom to share with the Zoom. But if you just put that one on the stage, actually my career by also providing a network. It's an opportunity to meet other charter holders and to actually uh, compare notes. Having more CFA holders, I would not say would avert another crisis, but would actually promote better practices and, and actually probably promote uh, more subject matter expertise. Against the backdrop of a shifting investment industry, adaptability is more important than ever. As firms face new demands for better integrated technology and more customized investment solutions, investment professionals are under pressure to adapt and embrace fresh challenges. In fact, 43% expect their role to be substantially different in five to 10 years, with 5% believing their role is unlikely to exist at all. The Investment Professional of the Future from CFA Institute considers this change through two lenses. The employee's lens, how industry skills and careers are evolving. The employer's lens, how industry cultures and organizational context are evolving. The report presents key considerations for individuals making decisions about their careers and for firms making decisions about their organizational environment and talent. It explores three factors shaping the attributes of the investment professional of the future. Changing roles. 89% of industry leaders agree that individuals' roles will be transformed multiple times during their careers and that adaptability and lifelong learning will be essential. Professionals will differentiate themselves by their ability to use technology to enhance the quality of work outputs. Those on investment teams who can combine knowledge of technology and economic intuition will have an edge. Changing skills and careers. T-shaped skills, the combination of domain-specific knowledge with wider knowledge of the ecosystem and the competencies to connect them are ranked as the most important future skill category by industry leaders. Demand for training and development in soft skills remains high. Catalysts to enhance career prospects include mentors, career roadmaps, cultivating a network, acquiring diverse experiences, and building a personal brand. Changing cultures and organizational context. A people-centered culture has significant growth potential in the next five to 10 years because of the growing traction with purpose and values in an organization's ethos. Employee experience will become a more common lever for organizations to differentiate themselves. The report concludes with next steps for both investment professionals and firms. For professionals, recommendations are, keep learning and adapting, invest in new era skills, get tech savvy. While investment organizations should keep developing the employee experience and cultivate stronger culture, invest in empowering leadership, communication, be change savvy, adopt a transformational worldview. The investment industry continues to change, but individuals and firms can prepare for the future now. To learn more, go to futureprofessional.cfainstitute.org. Welcome back, everybody. 
we're going to let the judges finish up. And if the judges will raise their hand or let me know when they're done, then we can get started with DU. While we're waiting for the judges to finish up, just want to make sure that everybody from DU is on and ready to go. Chelsea will be allowing you to present and taking you off of mute as well. We're getting you set up for that. We'll grab them in just a second here, Peter. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to go through everybody. Um, Ken, are you good? Yeah. Or, okay, Peter. I'm good. Derek. Allison. Ready. Great. Thank you. All right, guys, you ready? Ready. ready. Is ready. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So if you do want to, um, in the bottom where it says leave room, just hit leave breakout room and it'll take you to the main room. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Let's make sure everything's right. Great. All right. You can get started when you're ready. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, and thank you all for watching. We are honored to take part in this globally renowned competition. We are the University of Denver Research Challenge team here to present our research on VF Corporation. My name is Samantha, and I'm joined today by Malat, Mason, Bobby, and Andres. After months of extensive research and analysis, we are issuing a buy recommendation for VF Corporation at a one-year target price of 121, with an upside price appreciation of 47%. This indicates that VF's current stock is undervalued due to projected growth in the big four brands, paired with sustainable consumer taste preferences and strategic acquisitions. Our valuation was derived through a multi-stage 10-year discounted cash flow model, including five years of forecasted pro forma statements and five years of cash flow growth tapering down from four to two and a half percent in perpetuity. VF Corporation is an American lifestyle apparel and footwear company headquartered right here in Denver, Colorado. VF's more than 30 brands are organized into three main segments, the outdoor segment is comprised of brands like the North Face, Smart Wool, and Timberland. The active segment holds brands like Vans, Supreme, and Jansport. And last, the work segment is made up of brands like Dickies, Kodiak, and Walls. VF's four largest brands are Vans, the North Face, Timberland, and Dickies, carrying an average active weight of 63% in each of their respective segments. Over the last few years, VF has worked to diversify and shape its portfolio by acquiring three large brands, Supreme, Icebreaker, and Dickies, and we project that these acquisitions will create cost synergies by reducing duplicate SGNA expenses from 0.5 to 1.5% reduction in year 2025. And with that, I'll pass the mic to Malat. Thank you, Sam. Um, VF's global presence has been growing. Its global footprint covers more than 170 countries with 59% of its revenue coming from America, 28% from Europe, and 13% from Asia Pacific. Overall, VF has not only expanded its customer base geographically, but also has also increased the volume of traffic in store. Here we have the executive officers with decades of experience. And based on the responses we got the, from our Q&A, VF CSG commitment can be seen throughout the company's operations from the raw materials and suppliers it chooses to how the company designs each of its products. VF also focused on different sustainability areas like creating environmentally responsible and resource efficient processes, like the new science-based target they launched to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as well as its contribution to the community, which can be seen throughout the efforts to relieve some of the struggles brought by COVID-19 pandemic. And according to 3BL, VF was ranked in the top 100 for issues for ESG leadership. We analyzed the four crucial areas of ESG according to the Sustainability Account Accounting Standards Board. Environment, we have in addition to the science-based target, VF also commits to a circular business model, essentially reducing the amount of the, the amount of raw materials needed to make the products and designing products with longer life cycles. We have governance. VF aims to have 25% of people of color at direct and above level by 2030. Social and human capital. VF's commitment to anti-forced labor, human trafficking, and programs and options to advance racial equity. Modern innovation. We have that VF leads the industry in traceability, which makes it easier for consumers to understand where and what the product is made from. And the big VF brands creates relatively low rate of new entry. And the main factor to that entry of barrier are economies of scale, the required initial capex, and the need for extensive consumer customer base in the apparel industry. And with that, I'll pass it on to Mason. 
Thank you, Malat. One of VF's long-term strategic growth objectives is robust mergers and acquisitions. Supreme was purchased for $2.1 billion, and this acquisition will help VF capture key growth in Asia and some of the $185 billion street apparel market cap. The acquisition will affect the bottom line by elevating VF's DTC presence and prioritizing digital sales that account for 60% of all of Supreme's revenue. So in VF's 2024 strategic growth strategy is to capitalize on becoming a consumer and retail centric firm through brand diversification and supply chain efficiencies. VF optimized their portfolio by targeting brands with a consistent stream of cash flow, strong reoccurring customer bases, and powerful DTC presences. VF sees the Asia Pacific as the region with the most growth opportunity, and in fiscal year 2020, China alone accounted for 6.9% of VF's total revenue. So moving on, revenue is expected to grow due to opportunities in consumer discretionary spending that has been up 21.6% since September. Athleisure popularity is expected to grow at an 8.5% CAGR into 2025. This is due to the work from home environment. Uh, there's a continued rise of consumer preferences towards sustainability and fashion, where consumers want to feel connected to a brand that's worried about reducing expenses, but not at a cost to the environment. Some of the headwinds include lingering effects from COVID-19 and changes in the U.S. Consumer Confidence Index, which have decreased aggregate sales. So for our comps, we chose Nike, Columbia, Lululemon, Duluth, and Under Armour, based off of VF's big four brands and similar market cap to revenue. VF has posted consistently strong gross margins, and VF's gross margin is higher than the five-year peer group average of 49.9%. This depicts VF's ability to manufacture sustainable goods at a lower cost than their competitors. VF also has a profit margin that has consistently grown on an average CAGR of 2.6% over the last five years. VF's 2020 inventory ratio was 3.8%, which is higher than the peer group average of 3.1, indicating that VF is still churning through inventory. Now I'm gonna pass it on to Bobby. Thanks, Mason. So moving on to VFC's return on equity. Overall, leverage has increased over the past five years, pushing the equity multiplier up 59%. 2018 and 2020 were the major drops in ROE for VFC due to abnormal expenses. In 2018, they paid higher than normal income taxes. And in 2020, they had a large goodwill impairment. Overall, we forecast net profit margin returning to around 8.4% post-pandemic. So then moving on to the cost of capital, the major decision our team made was to add 350 basis points to the cost of equity to encapsulate the risks involving increases in leverage and the overall industry exposure to the ongoing pandemic. This leaves VFC with a cost of capital of 4.8%, which was used to discount the cash flows for our base case per share value of $121.54. So now taking a look at VFC's uh, free cash flow forecasts, we forecast the uh, cash flows to fluctuate a bit from 2021 to 2023. This is due to a 14.5% drop in revenue in 2021 with revenue returning back to regular figures post pandemic. And this created large swings in working capital that created this fluctuation. Following the fluctuation, we project uh, free cash flows to grow on average at 3.9% a year up until 2030. So now looking at our revenue growth figures, obviously we're a little bit more bullish than uh, Wall Street expectations, but this is because we believe VFC will gain market share through increased expansion to Asia Pacific, strong margins relative to its peers and in industry to giving VFC the competitive advantage, as well as continued growth in direct to consumer and online retail sales. We also believe that the Supreme acquisition will give VFC the ability to achieve cost synergies starting in 2022. Our forecast leaves VFC with a 35 times enterprise, uh, multi enterprise value multiple, which is in line with Nike, Lululemon, and Under Armour, which have multiples ranging from 33 to 36. And with that, I'm gonna pass things along to Andres. Thank you, Bobby. Bobby examined our base case model, and I also wanted to highlight our bear and bull case scenarios. The punchline is that VFC has limited room for downside. After accounting for pre-COVID revenue, the supreme acquisition and cost of capital. In the best case scenario, we arrive at a share price of $181 and in the worst case, $79. Despite increasing cost to capital, those range of share prices gives us further confidence in giving a buy recommendation. Financial leverage is one of the risks to investment recommendation, with Moody's downgrading VF's long-term credit rating to BAA1 on February 10th. Leverage increased with the Supreme Acquisition. 
We believe, however, that this acquisition will further diversify BF's portfolio and result in significant revenue growth. Foreign exchange volatility and COVID-19 also poses considerable risk. But the vaccine, as well as the fact that BF negotiates contracts as far in advance as possible, provides positive momentum. This chart shows the sensitivity of cost to capital. It underscores that financial leverage is a risk for the company, which did result in a credit rating drop. With manageable and responsible risk, there's greater return potential with the addition of Supreme in their portfolio. Overall, our team gives a buy recommendation, projecting a target price of $121. We expect that the company's superior competitive operating margin and planned 2024 strategy focused on Asia and online direct-to-consumer sales will drive revenue. We find that VF is positioned to bounce back in all three segments because they're an industry leader with a loyal community. We also expect that VF will experience cost synergies with Project Enable and Supreme. Finally, VF's commitment to sustainability creates resiliency, making this a company that you want to invest in. Thank you, and we look forward to answering your questions. Judges, you can start when you're ready. I'll start. Um, you guys did a phenomenal job. That was something you should be really proud of. Um, I, I wanted to uh, to start on your your outlook for um, I guess for your target price. Um, while while you're bullish, one way that I that I look at it is that the market is very bearish. In fact, the market is pricing it very similar to your bear case. So I'm curious, what do you, or why do you think the market is pricing the shares where they are today? And like, where do you think that, that it's disagreeing with you on your outlook? Thank you for the question, Derek. So I think that, or we believe that our biggest difference with the market is we have a very aggressive growth forecast for specifically Asia Pacific. For all four of the big brands, they are growing very aggressively and gaining market share in that space. So I think that's the biggest difference as well as we might've had a slightly lower discount rate than the market. Thank you, Bobby, appreciate it. It's um, mentioned that um, there's a 15% return on capital target and that that's predicated on lower cost sourcing. How is VF Corp able to source product at a lower cost than say a larger company like Nike? So VF does this through diversification of their supply chain and they try to add value along the value chain. So VF's in uh, over 170 countries and of that about I believe it was 93, sorry, 72% of the uh, units are manufactured by independent contractors. Uh, they also have a pretty significant um, omni-channel distribution uh, along with 23 distribution centers across the world. So it's mostly just due to them diversifying their uh, suppliers and adding value in that way. And I will also add here that one of the great things about the economies of scale that BF has is they also manage risk here. No more than 7% comes from any supplier. So they do, really do a good job of managing long-term supplier relationships and also making sure that risk level stays low. Great. Can I ask? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Ahead, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, can, I wanted to ask a question about synergies. I think it was mentioned a couple times. Supreme was going to bring with them um, sourcing synergies. Can you detail a few of those for us and what the margin impact you expect to be? Yes. Yeah, so as far as the synergies that we built into our model based on the Supreme acquisition, we're expecting VFC to take a best athlete approach. And if you want to look at it kind of as an analogy for human capital and like Noah's Ark, you want to take the two best of each animal. You don't need four of them. So we think that eventually starting in 2022 and moving forward from there, they are going to start to identify duplicative, uh, both human capital as well as system and technology subscriptions that they don't need 
more than they currently, or they, they have too many that they uh, currently have versus what they really need for their system or for their business moving forward. Yeah, so adding to that, BIF um, will also efficiently reduce the complexities that arise with focusing on efficient branding, um, as well as Bobby mentioned, the reducing SGNA, duplicate recruitment and capital, and also acquiring companies that align with the value and strategic mission like Supreme um, that will be able to elevate the DTC, the online sales, um, which Supreme's um, online sales come 60% of its revenues generated online. And that leaves a plenty of opportunity to leverage this momentum and scale up through the retail store expansion. Great, thank you. So what do you think of the balance sheet? We're at four times leverage uh, post Supreme temporarily, then it's trending down toward three times, but we have very low interest rates and easy money out there. Do you think that the company is under leveraged, over leveraged, or what's the optimal level in your view? I think that currently, uh, it might be hard to put a pinpoint on them being optimally leveraged currently. They're the highest they've ever been levered in their entire existence, but it's really gonna come down to how interest rates react as we get out of this pandemic. Right now, it's a great time to go out and get more debt capital, but if inflationary times come through and inflation or and interest rates do go up, it could be kind of the perfect storm for VFC as Moody's did downgrade some of their unsecured long-term debt pretty recently. So they might not be able to get it as cheap as they would like to. I would say one positive side on the question of interest rates is just the Federal Reserve Chairman's uh, testimony today before the Senate Banking Committee. He did uh, um, acknowledge that um, even though we're seeing some hopes for economy and the economy starting to get better, he still thinks that the economy is not in a place of like certainty. And so he's committed to keep low interest rates interest rates low, which I think is going to be a positive benefit for VFC. What do you think can go wrong here with the company, either financially or other than COVID, forgetting COVID? What is the thing that keeps you awake at night if you bought this stock with a, you know, have a very aggressive target price here, but you're bullish. What can go wrong here? So I think one of the biggest things that could go wrong was if uh, those synergies from the Supreme acquisition aren't met, especially if those aren't being met in the Asia Pacific region. Also, if some of the uh, big four brands, if those, um, we were fairly bullish on growth in the Asia Pacific as well as Europe and South America. So if brands like Vans, Timberlands, um, if they're not in the North Face, if they're not meeting those, um, those growth percentages, then that'll probably significantly hurt our valuation. Okay. Did you guys um, uh, purposefully, uh, or, or let me ask it a different way. How did you think about interest rates uh, and your outlook uh, when you, um, you know, put your whack together? And the reason I ask that is because um, you know, a lot of folks would, would normalize that, um, you know, say our view of interest rates is going to be higher. So I, I guess I'm just curious how, how you thought about that and how that informed your, your, uh, your target price. So we encapsulated a lot of the interest rate risk in the uh, bear case where we actually envisioned VFC getting a credit downgrade, which increased the total cost of capital. But as Andres mentioned, we followed what the Fed's been saying where we don't expect a rise in interest rates in the near future. So that's kind of how we approached the interest rate uh, problem. Okay. So then if, if we take your price target, um, the implied multiple on that, would we're already higher than, than uh, I believe we're at the highest multiple the company's traded at um, in its history. I could be wrong about that. And you're saying it should trade 50% higher. I'm just, I'm just curious how to, how to unpack that. Um, how to think about that. Maybe you could just add a little color. Yes, we think that their, the acquisition of Supreme perfectly met their company's midterm and long-term strategy of going into the, or expanding on the direct-to-consumer as well as the online retail. Supreme has always been very strong on their online retail sales and direct-to-consumer, as well as their impact in the Asia-Pacific there's a lot of market share available out there. And that's why we believe this uh, 
the multiple that they're going to be trading at should be increased. Okay, thank you. You mentioned um, that they've been part of the dividend aristocrats for 30 plus years and they pay a strong dividend. Do you think that's a conflict with their acquisition strategy? And what do you think the best use of cash should be for them going forward? Or maybe said another way, does it send a conflicting message to potential investors that they pay a strong dividend, yet you're, they're also trying to achieve a high valuation predicated on acquisition growth? Yeah, I think it definitely will <clears throat> raise some red flags from that perspective. But I think that um, as for their cash on hand, I think they should keep that relatively high just from a liquidity perspective. And due to their um, once due to their credit rating and due to their high leverage, I think it'll be important for them to maintain that instead of paying dividends in the future. So you're saying they you, should cut that dividend? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think, and the team can step in here too, but I think um, as long as they have that cash on hand, it'll help them um, just from a credit ratings perspective. Yes, to kind of add in what Mason was saying, obviously they still increased their dividend during this pandemic year, which was kind of crazy with all their revenue drops. And unfortunately, I mean, that's- it. We're at 10 minutes. Thank you very much, guys. Great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was great to see both teams. And we're looking forward to a little break here. And while the judges compile their scores, uh, you can stick around. We're going to play another video uh, for the next 10 minutes or so. And judges, briefly, how did that last break work for you? Did you need a little more time or a little less time? Fine. Or was it just right? That was right. Fine for me. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, we will bring everybody back in about 10 minutes and we'll go ahead and let everybody take a break again while the judges compile their scores. women are sometimes viewed or their, their competence and level of expertise, particularly in technical subject matters like investment and finance and technology, sometimes are doubted or questioned a little bit more rigorously. When you hand your business card and you have those three letters after your name, I think it helps quash any even subconscious questions around uh, you know, whether or not you deserve to be there. Without a doubt, the best experience and the most rewarding experience I've had in college thus far. When this competition came up, I thought that this would be the best testing ground to see if I'm cut out for it or if it's something that I'd like to pursue in the future. It's a great opportunity to reveal uh, additional skills and to improve uh, the knowledge of financial analysis. And the best way to learn how to do is to do it, even uh, if you do not know how to do it. It's a great learning experience that you can't get hardly anywhere else. I encourage anyone to do it who wants to be serious in their career in finance. We learned a lot of things in the classroom, and this was a great opportunity to be able to apply them to real-life situations. The most important thing is that we learned how to keep calm and go ahead. I think my memory would be networking with everyone. I didn't build a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of long hours staying in school, so it was very challenging in terms of workload. Apparently, it also gives us a chance to travel all over the world and visit places like this. No doubt the, the best thing we got out of this, and everyone knows this through their own personal experiences, but when you walk through fire with someone, we absolutely grinded to get the work we put into this done, and looking back, it's so satisfying. Uh, I mean, 
Friends for life, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. The winner of the 2015 CFA Institute Research Challenge Global Final is Canisius College. I couldn't feel happier. I am basically on cloud nine. We worked so hard. We all came together, and this is basically surreal. It's a surreal experience, and I couldn't even imagine it, to be completely honest. And I'm, I'm going to envy the, the people that are going to be here next year and, and do the same thing we did. So we're, we're thrilled and I, yeah, I can't even speak anymore. <laughs> if you have the chance to do it, it's a great learning experience. When we're looking to do recruiting and candidates put forward that they're a CFA charter holder or they're undertaking the examinations, it immediately makes you think that they're really focused on self-development. The energy and excitement of the CFA Institute Research Challenge is captured best by the students, mentors, judges, employers and sponsors who participate in this impressive global competition. The annual competition promotes ethics and best practices in equity research through mentoring and training in analysis and presentation. In front of a live audience, teams present their analysis to a panel of investment industry experts sharing their reports with their mentors and advisors, sometimes meeting personally with the company leaders of the firms they analyze. Teams compete at three levels. Winners from each local level competition advance to the regional level to compete against teams 35, in their region. 43, the challenge 50, culminates 50, in a global 59, final of the top four teams. Right. For students, an extraordinary resume 52, builder and chance to interact with a global 60, community 60, of their Would everybody please mute themselves? Investment professionals volunteer as judges, graders, and mentors, promoting best practices and ethical decision making. Corporations promote ethics and education and receive unbiased opinions from students. To truly appreciate this thrilling series of events, join us for the world's most prestigious investment research competition, the CFA Institute Research Challenge. But the CFA has actually influenced my career by also providing a network. It's an opportunity to meet other charter holders and to actually uh, compare notes. Having more CFA holders, let's say with our and other prices, would actually promote better practices um, and actually probably promote uh, more subject matter expertise. Against the backdrop of a shifting investment industry, adaptability is more important than ever. As firms face new demands for better integrated technology and more customized investment solutions, investment professionals are under pressure to adapt and embrace fresh challenges. In fact, 43% expect their role to be substantially different in 5 to 10 years, with 5% believing their role is unlikely to exist at all. The Investment Professional of the Future from CFA Institute considers this change through two lenses. The employee's lens, how industry skills and careers are evolving. The employer's lens, how industry cultures and organizational context are evolving. The report presents key considerations for individuals making decisions about their careers and for firms making decisions about their organizational environment and talent. It explores three factors shaping the attributes of the investment professional of the future. Changing roles. 89% of industry leaders agree that individuals' roles will be transformed multiple times during their careers and that adaptability and lifelong learning will be essential. Professionals will differentiate themselves by their ability to use technology to enhance the quality of work outputs. Those on investment teams who can combine knowledge of technology and economic intuition will have an edge. Changing skills and careers. 
T-shaped skills. The combination of domain-specific knowledge with wider knowledge of the ecosystem and the competencies to connect them are ranked as the most important future skill category by industry leaders. Demand for training and development in soft skills remains high. Catalysts to enhance career prospects include mentors, career roadmaps, cultivating a network, acquiring diverse experiences, and building a personal brand. Changing cultures and organizational context. A people-centered culture has significant growth potential in the next five to 10 years because of the growing traction with purpose and values in an organization's ethos. Employee experience will become a more common lever for organizations to differentiate themselves. The report concludes with next steps for both investment professionals and firms. For professionals, recommendations are keep learning and adapting, invest in new era skills, get tech savvy. While investment organizations should keep developing the employee experience and cultivate stronger culture, invest in empowering leadership, communication, be change savvy, adopt a transformational worldview. The investment industry continues to change, but individuals and firms can prepare for the future now. To learn more, go to futureprofessional.cfainstitute.org. Welcome back, everybody. How are the judges doing? Doing another minute or two? Doing good. All good. Very good. All right, very good. Are the UCCS students here? UCCS? Howdy. Yes. Looks yep. good. Would somebody from the school like to turn on the slides? Yeah, I'll go slides. ahead and do that. And UCCS at the one minute remaining mark for both Q&A and your presentation, I will wave this piece of paper on the screen to let you know you're down to your last 60 seconds on each section. Okay, thank you. And you guys can begin whenever you're ready. You guys ready? Yep. Ooh. Thanks for coming to our presentation of VF Corp, uh, NASDAQ ticker VFC. My name is John Groh. I'm here with Sean Myers, Joab Rolf, Chance Vasquez, and Chad Watkins. Uh, we'll get right into it. We're, we're recommending a, a sell here with a potential downside well over 18%. Our projected price target coming in at what we perceive as a generous $67. VF operates in a very matured sector with fierce competition and uh, little projected growth in all but its big four brands. On top of this, VF is now highly levered with its issuance of a large amount of debt during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it tends to misuse or underuse its current asset base, leading us to believe that this debt is eventually gonna become a bigger problem. We also believe that the market has overfavored VFC's recent acquisition of Supreme. And then on the projection side, we haven't been able to prove that VFC has the growth potential in sales or margins to justify its current market price. VF Corporation operates within the apparel sub industry of the consumer cyclical sector. The sector is very reliant on the current economic climate. The pandemic has had a very substantial negative effect on the industry's sales. As you can see in the chart, global lockdowns materially affected sales numbers in the first, second, and fourth quarters of 2020 the recovery in the third quarter dampened by the surging virus. Companies in the sector have been increasing leverage, furloughing employees, uh, pausing share repurchase, and initiating significant cost-saving measures to get through the pandemic. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, sales had been growing at a rate of 2.39% since the 2008 mortgage crisis and had reached $16.4 billion in December of 2019. The pandemic has accelerated the downfall of the department store, and this trend has been in place over the last 20 years, with e-commerce growing at double-digit rates. Overall, we be, believe pent up demand from 2020 will lead to double digit sales numbers in 21, and, but this does not justify the current valuations. 
VF competes with Nike, Ralph Lauren, Haynes Brand, Under Armour, and Columbia Sportswear. The sector is mature and highly competitive, subject to high buyer power and very low supplier power. Sector leaders are those that are able to stay competitive by building brands that are able to stay relevant, like Nike. VF Corp specializes in selling world-class apparel, footwear, and accessories. The company breaks down its revenue into three main selling segments, which are the activewear segment, the outdoor segment, and the workwear segment. Although the brand has other brands, its main source of revenue comes from its big four brands, which are Vans, North Face, Dickies, and Timberland. Looking at revenue in 2020 by segment, 47% of the revenue came from the activewear segment, 44% from the outdoor segment, and only 9% from the workwear segment. Looking at 2020 revenue by region, 58% of sales came in the North American region, 28% in Europe, and 13% in the Asia Pacific region. Real quick, we'll touch on ESG. Uh, VF has a huge focus on environmental sustainability and ethical sourcing. Uh, we see this in VF's long-term sustainability strategy called Made for Change, which takes aim at carbon emission depletion as well. Using 2017 as a benchmark, VFC hopes to deplete its carbon emission by 30% by 2030. Uh, socially, VF is also a team player. Uh, North Face's Endurance Challenge and Vans Give Back Day both outline VF's presence in the community uh, and their efforts to giving back. Uh, lastly, governance. Uh, VFC does a good job here, uh, paying chief officers through performance drive incentives. Only 10% of Rendell's pay is salary-based, and the rest is uh, delivered, like I said, through those performance-based incentives. Uh, the board of directors is diversified along company segments and is subject to annual review and evaluation. Uh, it's no secret that VFC takes its environmental and ethical standing very serious, uh, and it's admirable that VF prioritizes these efforts. Uh, however, these environmental ethical standards sometimes get in the way of responsible business. Uh, in December, VF uh, rejected the purchase of North Face jackets for employees working at Innovex Downhole Solutions, a Texan petroleum company. And while their actions do coincide with the recent push towards green energy in the middle of a pandemic hitting their specific ex sector extremely hard, uh, we believe that VF's stance on this issue, albeit admirable, is uh, simply a luxury that VF and its shareholders can't afford. Uh, for a company with decreasing margins, increasing competition, and a self-proclaimed goal of venturing into new markets with their products, VF should not be making decisions about who and who doesn't get to purchase them. So we wanted to look at averages for VF Corp's margins and uh, other ratios for 2015 to 2019. And this was to disregard the effects of COVID-19. So for margins, they maintained averages that were higher than the pure average, and they had the highest EBITDA margin over the five-year period. As you can see, they maintained strong operating and gross margin, and they also had strong inventory turnover. However, their return on assets is a bit concerning. Um, VF's low ROA indicates they're generating less net income on more investments. And this does take into account their debt, which has been increasing over the last five years. Overall, the chart shows they don't necessarily struggle with any of their margins or other performance ratios against their competitors but the performance in these various ratios is actually a bit deceiving. So in light of this, we wanted to look further into their debt and compare some of their debt ratios over a five-year period and also in 2019 specifically. So the graph above shows their debt to equity, which has been increasing noticeably over the last five years. Uh, VF Corp is indicated in the blue bars and Nike is in the orange. Uh, this explains their low ROA and their high, higher ROE, and their increasing debt shows concern as they've struggled to maintain asset efficiency like Nike, but they're loading on debt at a faster rate than Nike, and we find Nike to be the gold standard of the apparel industry. So we also wanted to look at their EBIT interest coverage and their debt to assets, and as shown by the red and green indicators, it's clear that VF Corp is considerably more leveraged than their competitors especially Nike. And we acknowledge that the cost of debt is incredibly cheap in light of the pandemic. So it doesn't come as a surprise to us that they're loading up on debt. However, what is concerning about their debt load is the volatility that comes with it. And when speaking with the company, it was made apparent that paying off their debt was not their top priority in the near future. And they also plan on increasing their dividend. And we don't think that VF Corp will necessarily struggle to pay their debt but we don't see them generating sales and margins like Nike as they've never performed like Nike before. And if VF Corp struggles to generate consistent sales growth like they have in the past, 
then we think they'll run into further problems with higher interest payments and low earnings. All right, so now we're gonna talk about VF Corp's recent acquisition of Supreme. And although we believe that Supreme is a decent company, we don't think it is a strategic fit for VF Corp. And if you're not familiar, Supreme is a streetwear company that sells apparel and accessories for extremely high prices, like t-shirts for $300. And the way they're able to do this is because how scarce they are. They run a limited number of units and then the hype and the rarity of it draws in the customers and they're willing to pay this premium. But this brings us concerns regarding the scalability of this brand. Uh, we don't believe that VF Corp will be able to scale up production for Supreme reasonably without destroying the, the scarcity model that's innate with Supreme. Uh, if they start running a bunch of t-shirts of Supreme, all of a sudden it becomes a lot less rare and a lot less coveted and they're not able to charge the high prices and that will tank their margins on these products. Uh, we believe that their acquisition of Supreme is heavily weighted into the current share price as seen by the jump in the share price whenever they announced the acquisition of Supreme. And this leads us into our final valuation. Uh, although we believe that VF Corp is a good company, uh, we think it's overvalued and we're recommending a sell for a potential downside of eight, over 18%. Uh, in our model, we forecasted sales growths for fiscal year 21 of double digit decrease in sales due to the pandemic, followed by a double digit increase in sales in fiscal 22 following a recovery. And the way we think we differ from the market is in fiscal years 23 through 25, where we projected an 8% increase in active sales in their active segment, 6% increase in their outdoor segment, and 4% increases in their workwear segment for those years respectively. Uh, as we mentioned in our financial analysis, we believe that Nike is somewhat of the gold standard in the apparel industry with averaging growth rates and revenues of 7.5%. And after calibrating our model, uh, we figured that VF Corp would have to average around 9% for fiscal years 23 through 25 in order to arrive at the current share price. Although we think that VFC is a good company, we do not think that they are a Nike level company and we don't think that they have the level of brand equity that Nike does. As mentioned in the sector analysis, uh, they compete in a very mature industry with growth rates near that of inflation or the growth rate in the population. And it's driven by increases in market share. And Combine this with their heavy leverage due that they increased their debt during the pandemic, a loss of what the company calls brand heat could spell disaster for sales as a loss in interest in their products could lead to declining sales. So that's our evaluation and recommendation. Are there any questions? You mentioned um, your uh your your sales estimate is significantly lower than the street, especially in the out years. Uh, is is that um, sales growth uh, cognizant of potential acquisitions, or is that just organic sales growth from existing brands? So uh, I believe it's more so organic sales growth from their existing brands. We did factor in their acquisition of Supreme with the numbers that they gave us. And this was part of our activewear segment and we projected 8% growth in that segment. How important is the dividend? You know, this is a dividend aristocrat. I think they've increased their dividends every year for over 30 years, but you're saying they're, over, they're getting over leveraged here. Uh, are you recommending a dividend cut and if that happened, given all the passive investing these days with ETFs, would that hurt uh, a company like BF? Because if it started cutting, it would be taken out of its, the ETFs would throw it out. So <laughs> who would come, what investors would come to replace it if they didn't keep increasing dividends? Um. Well, as we mentioned in the company analysis, uh, they have a lot of smaller brands that they've acquired. And although, as you mentioned, taking it out of these dividend, high dividend yield in T ETFs, uh, this money could probably be put to better use and it could probably generate higher sales growth, uh, higher growth rates if they invested it back into these smaller companies 
and nurtured them. Don't you think that uh, with low interest rates and easy money out there because of the Fed and money printing, that companies should take advantage of this environment and, and raise debt capital? Or is that, is that unwise in the long run? I would say it's, um, it's not unwise, but at the rate that VF Corp is doing it, I would say that's unwise as um, from 2019 to 2020, they've nearly increased their debt a hundred percent. And if you look at their coverage ratios, um, they lag behind their competitors significantly, especially like a company like Nike. So like Nike has about the same debt as them, but has almost like 10 times the EBIT interest coverage as them, which is what concerns us. Can I ask that question a slightly different way? Maybe, you know, when you look at their capital structure, you've noted that they have too much debt. What to you is the correct level or range of leverage a company like this should hold? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we did we did note that although they, I guess our analysis went into how they're using this debt. And we did note that they issued a, almost $3 billion of debt last year in light of the pandemic and the lower interest rates. Mm -hmm. And um, it's worth assuming that a lot of this money went towards their acquisition of Supreme as it was a $2.1 billion acquisition. And although they increased their debt 100%, uh, the revenues, at least in our projections, only saw a 2% increase in revenues. So they have a big obligation that they have to put up in the future. And we just don't see the growth that will be able to cover that in operating cash flows per se. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I think you guys, you guys did a really good job. You should be proud of what you presented. I know it was a lot of work. Um, I know that you're, you're the resident bear here um, yeah, on, on the name and you know, kudos to you for, uh, for being willing to put that out there. Um, but I, I'm going to challenge you. Let's, let's say we fast forward a year from now and the stocks, we wake up and the stocks at $125. Where, what do you think would have happened counter to your view fundamentally that would that would cause that? And what probability would you place on that type of a scenario occurring? Um, so if we were to wake up a year from now and, and stock price were to be that, I would say the strongest chance of that happening would be from them being able to scale up um, Supreme. And that would completely ruin the scarcity model of Supreme. Supreme sells shirts that are hundreds of dollars and only a limited supply. So for them to keep those same margins, it doesn't really make sense that they're going to be selling thousands and thousands of shirts at $200 a shirt. So one's going to have to give. So I would say the probability of that is extremely low as their other brands, the other big four brands that they have don't have growth rates that are well over 10%, at least historically for them. I'd to like to add on that if I can. Um, so if you don't take our word for it, the company said themselves that they, they're going to take a hands-off approach with Supreme, which means they're not going to try to scale it up. They're not going to try to increase sales in the near future. And this kind of contradicts the normal route of how these acquisitions go, where the subsidiary gets to take advantage of the parent company's distribution channels. But, uh, since they're not scaling up production, and just leaving it as is, they kind of paid the premium for this acquisition and they're not really for, forming the gestalt that you kind of want to form with an acquisition. Mm -hmm. So you don't see a, another part of their business that could um, surprise you or surprise the market um, or something on the cost structure. You, you feel it really, the whole fulcrum could only be on what happens with Supreme. Yeah, at least, I mean, for it to grow to $125, 
So, I mean, it's, I think it's below $80 right now, which means another, you know, $40 increase in the stock price would mean that either like North Face or Vans would have to generate that sales. And none of those companies or those segments, I should say, their active or outdoor segment has grown over 10% in sales historically. Great. And Thank you. Over, over the last yeah. month, um, the Supreme acquisition has been talked about and, like we said, factored in their stock price. And we looked at an ETF, um, an apparel ETF, RTH, and is down 2.9% over the last month. And VF is down 4.9% since then, even with the news of Supreme, which kind of shows that they're underperforming in the apparel sector. That's a quick question. Quick, quick final question here for me is, I, I don't quite understand how you get a $67 intrinsic value. What did you use as the basis for valuing this? Was it a PE, price the uh, enterprise value to EBITDA, DCF model? Uh, how, how did you come up with that? Yeah, it was a discounted cash flow model. Uh, we projected five years of earnings and uh, we discounted it back. Uh, we used... Uh, terminal value matrix for the, the free cash flow and the terminal value in order to get a, a bit more accurate result factoring in uh, different weighted average cost of capital and different growth rates. Was there a slide for that? I, I don't remember seeing that. Uh, there's no slide for the model. It's in, our, it's in our report. Got it. Thanks. You, yeah. you noted um, that their mar gross margins and margins are higher than their competitors, particularly Nike. What are they doing different than Nike to drive those higher margins? Do you want me to go back to that slide, Chad? Yeah. Okay. So actually, so... Um, no, so they're, they're better than the peer average, but really um, like this chart. So Nike is actually doing um, uh, the only one that they're doing better than Nike in is uh, gross and EBITDA. But I mean, their EBITDA is only a fraction and it's barely in gross. And this was an average from 2015 to 2019. Um, so they're not necessarily doing better than Nike on their margins. They're actually doing a lot worse, um, especially um, when it turn when it comes to terms of uh, managing their assets, like their return on assets and the return on equity as well. What do you think they could do better on in terms of margins? How could they improve those going forward? Well, I think the acquisition of Supreme is obviously going to bump up their margins a little bit because. They have, Supreme has such high margins. And is that, probably, is, and that but, is time. Thank you very much. Good job, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we've seen three teams tonight, and we're looking forward to seeing them all come back here in a minute for the awards. But we're going to take about a three to four minute break. And during that time, the judges are going to go to their breakout room. And they'll stay there for the next 15 or 20 minutes. We'll do a short video, and then we're going to come back with our panel. So we're going to have three advisors and or three advisors or mentors from the three different universities. And we're going to be talking about what the research challenge means to the students and to the university. So let's take a break. Uh, we'll see you back here in three minutes after a short video. And then while we're waiting for that video to start, everybody is now welcome to go ahead and take your, yourself off of the video or to start showing your video again. Uh, all the students, please do that. And if the um, guests want to do that as well, you're welcome to. After the three minutes are up. Thanks. Women are sometimes viewed or their, their competence and level of expertise, particularly in technical subject matters like investment and finance and technology, sometimes are doubted or questioned a little bit more rigorously. When you hand your business card and you have those three letters after your name, I think it helps quash any even subconscious questions around, uh, you know, whether or not you deserve to be there.
without a doubt the best experience and the most rewarding experience I've had in college thus far. When this competition came up, I thought that this would be the best testing ground to see if I'm cut out for it or if it's something that I'd like to pursue in the future. It's a great opportunity to reveal uh, additional skills and to improve uh, the knowledge of financial analysis. And the best way to learn how to do is to do it, even uh, if you do not know how to do it. It's a great learning experience that you can't get hardly anywhere else. I encourage anyone to do it who wants to be serious in their career in finance. We learn a lot of things in the classroom, and this was a great opportunity to be able to apply them to real-life situations. The most important thing is that we learn how to keep calm and go ahead. I think my memory would be networking with everyone. It entailed a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of <laughs> long hours staying in school, so it was very challenging in terms of workload. Apparently, it also gives us a chance to travel all over the world and visit places like this. No doubt the, the best thing we got out of this, and everyone knows this through their own personal experiences, but when you walk through fire with someone, we absolutely grinded to get the work we put into this done, and looking back, it's so satisfying. Uh, I mean, yeah. friends for life, for sure. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. The winner of the 2015 CFA Institute Research Challenge Global Final is Canisius College. I couldn't feel happier. I basically on cloud nine. We worked so hard. We all came together, and this is basically surreal. It's a surreal experience, and I couldn't even imagine it, to be completely honest. And I'm, I'm going to envy the, the people that are going to be here next year and, and do the same thing with it. So we're, we're thrilled and I, yeah, I can't even speak anymore. <laughs> if you have the chance to do it, it's a great learning experience. Welcome back, folks. Now, while you're able to um, unmute yourself as well, I would ask that you continue to mute yourself uh, if you would, but please show, show your video. And um, let's bring our panelists up here in a minute. So our panelists are Van Wombel, from, uh, one of the mentors from DU, Greg Kuppenheimer, an advisor from UCCS, and Matt Fleming, an advisor from UCB. So I'd like to, just like we did with the judges, had a little bit of an intro, a self intro. So Van, it looks like you're up first. Would you mind um, introducing yourself? Sure. Uh, so I think the most interesting part for the audience is uh, this is my ninth year of involvement with the CFA Research Challenge. Uh, the first year that I did it, I was grading papers, and this makes eight years that I've mentored a team from the University of Denver. Um, in my career, I have been an investor and portfolio manager for 12 years now. And prior to that, I spent 10 years in corporate America doing corporate strategy and capital allocation at Coca-Cola and Molson Coors. Thank you, Van, I appreciate it. So that was Van Womble. And next is Greg Kuppenheimer. Uh, hey there. So, uh, Greg Kuppenheimer, I, um, my background is I was in industry for over 20 years. I started out of college as a uh, bond analyst and then a bond trader and portfolio manager, went back to graduate school and then ended up on wall street. Uh, most of my career was at Goldman Sachs where I ran various derivative teams for them. So that's my background is mostly derivatives. So I'm faking the equity valuation bit of it. Uh, I think what's most interesting about this for students is, a lot of what we do in the classroom is very prescriptive. You know, do this, this is whack, this is how you value a company. And I think this is just the most powerful uh, example of getting them some real world experience where really the work doesn't stop, right? I mean, how much work did the teams put into these presentations? It really doesn't end. So glad to be a part of it. Yeah, we might hear that again throughout this, uh, the next few minutes about how much work the teams put in. How about you, Matt? 
Sure, thanks. So my name is uh, Matt Fleming. I work at CU Boulder. It's uh, called the Burge Center for Finance. Been there a little over a year. And uh, on the opposite of Van, this is my first CFA case competition. So really happy to be here. I've been with CU though for a little over seven years now. So more on the academic side uh, from New York originally and moved out here. Um, while I was in New York, I worked more on the private equity and angel investing. So that was really interesting. It's been able to leverage that with my role in the finance department. And um, with the Burge Center and the finance department, it's really been great. I've seen a lot of familiar names in the Zoom tiles here. Really great working with industry and organizations like the CFA. You know, at the business school, this is our definition of extracurricular activities. And so the students, you know, love it. And especially given COVID, you know, everything's remote. So trying to find the opportunities where they are. And this is just a great example of it. So thanks for putting this on. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Well, if I can actually uh, start with you. Um, the, in your experience, since every year a new group of students is ready to compete, and since you were running into students, some for the first time or in a different capacity, at least for you this year, mm -hmm. uh, what did you say to students when you were talking to them about the research challenge? So, you know, marketing is a huge part of, of getting students to uh, attend and to, you know, step up to bat, right? As you can imagine, as everyone acknowledged, there's a lot of work, a lot of effort that goes into this. And so highlighting the importance of networking and the importance of these opportunities. I mean, you know, the, the lead school of business is 5,000 students and only five get to participate in the CFA case competition. And so while it's open to all, you know, so few step up and just highlighting how important that is and getting your face in front of everyone is uh, valuable to your, to your long-term career. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it does sound like that's probably one of the big biggest benefits. Um, that, and to, on that note, is it is it more of an academic or more of a career focus when you're thinking about the research challenge? Is that boomerang back to me? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So I think it's it straddles both, right? You you, you try to incorporate what is what is taught in the classroom. I, I've taught some undergrad courses and our, our team, the Boulder's team here is made up of mostly graduate students, but you, you utilize and you harness some of the theories that is brought in the classroom and then you project it into the business world and then you, you know, pre present and you practice. And that's one thing I stress this is at the end of the day, it's practice, practice for the real world. And, you know, you're not expected to know everything. And even when you get your first job or even if it's your third job, if you're not a uh, a long-term, you know, experienced person in it, you're not expected to know everything. And so it's, there's a lot of components to being successful in everything you do. And this is just a, a great uh, exercise in that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Greg, down in UCCS, what are you saying to the students and how many years have you been involved in this uh, competition, either directly or peripherally? Uh, I've been the faculty mentor for this, our third, uh, third competition. Um, I think what appeals to students is two things. It's getting out a little bit of the classroom. I think, you know, motivated students are kind of excited by the idea of competition. I think the other thing uh, as well is, is distinguishing yourself. You know, all of our graduates would like to get out and get a good job. And I think this type of activity really sets you apart, which is appealing, you know, for motivated students. Mm, yeah. Uh, do you find that the students are thinking about this at both the undergraduate and graduate level? Uh, our teams, all three teams have been exclusively undergrads. Interesting. And you have graduate students in UCCS as well in the program. We do. Uh, you know, we probably could do a better job of, of trying to get them involved, but so far it's been the undergrads who've taken the lead. Well, it's different at every school. Uh, what do you talk about when you're focusing uh, on the research challenge with your students? How do you first bring that, uh, break the ice with them? Uh, we offer a class in equity valuation and so doing the research challenge is entirely voluntary and, and, and up to them. It's, it's totally extracurricular, but it really allows them to take those skills and, and then expand upon them because a lot of what we do in classroom is, is very prescriptive. Um, so a lot of the selling or a lot of the, uh, the encouragement is this is, this is maybe one of the coolest things you could do as a finance major in college. Uh, give it a try. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great. Appreciate that. And uh, let me turn it over to Van. Van, when you're thinking about this, these nine years, 
have you run across um, students that are more uh, undergrad, grad, and also talk to me about how many of them are CFA focused or focused on other aspects? I think every year we've had a mix and I think that's deliberate. Um, you know, DU has both programs, undergrad and grad. Um, and I think it's important to have both. I, I, I know that in the past, we have asked if it's possible to field more than one team because some years there's so much interest in it that, and I forget what the current answer is, you can, you can remind us, but uh, I'm sorry, what was the rest of the year? So, and, and then how many of them are, see, I'm out, let me ask and let me answer that. Uh, this year we said every school can open up to a couple of teams. Hmm. And so if they, if they school one or two, they could have chosen to do that. And, and then it depends on the number of students and number of teams. Um, it, is, it is somewhat of our choice. So we haven't made the decision for every year that we're gonna do the same thing, possibly in the future again. And then the other part of my question was about the CFA versus non-CFA oriented student. You know, a lot of folks might be interested in uh, some other aspect, corporate finance perhaps, or, uh, or perhaps not finance at all. What do you think? I think every year we've had people who do go on to pursue it eventually. Um, I always encourage people that it, as painful as the CFA journey is, it's worth it. And at the end, when you finally get to stop beating your head against that wall of uh, <laughs> the annual exam schedule, uh, it feels really good when you stop beating your head on the wall. And, and, but, Seriously, the CFA is the greatest credential I can imagine. I, in, in the 20 years or more since I completed mine, it, I have never met anyone who doesn't have some degree of respect for it. So it, it, it indicates that you're willing to do your homework and operate at a high standard. So uh, we certainly encourage people to pursue it. Yeah, thank you, Van. You know, there are multiple challenges and competitions out there. Uh, I went to DU and I had, uh, I went, I was in, uh, took part in two different competitions, academic related competitions. And I know there's many more now today. So when you're thinking about the different competitions, what other competitions are out there right now that you would, that are on the top of your mind when you're talking to students or that other students are mentioning to you? Any overlap? Well, I'll just jump in and say the, uh, <clears throat> the one that comes to mind would be a, like the CME, CME trading challenge, which of course is radically different to this, mm -hmm. but it is a common, it's a, it's a popular one. It's a worldwide and there is a uh, cash at the end of the tunnel, which is always a nice draw. And, um, you know, it's kind of like at the beginning of that challenge, it's a completely different strategy. It's, you know, it's over a month's time and you kind of have to say, all right, we have a month, kind of flip a coin, make a decision and go with it. There's not a lot of room for, for navigating it. And uh, happy to announce CU Boulder came in fifth out of 500 this year, nice. which, was, which was a lot of fun. And we fielded a number of teams, but uh, it's just the first one that came to my mind. Yeah, fantastic. Um, how about down at UCCX? Have you heard about any? that uh, you that your students have been interested in uh there's an ethics challenge that that we participate in every year um i think it's a different skill set so there's different groups of students who are attracted to something analytical uh so i don't i can't think of anything as analytical and as detailed as the cfa competition um the ethics challenge is, is kind of focusing focusing on a different set of skills it's a great opportunity for students it's unique hmm, yeah um, who gravitates to each one of these types of challenges? You mentioned that the ethics is a different set of students. Um, that, by the way, DU has something that's uh, related as well, don't they? Uh, do they have some sort of ethics competition? And is this the one you're talking about, or is it a different competition sponsored by another university? Uh, to me? Yes. Right. I'm going to confess I'm not overly involved in the ethics competition, so I'm not sure who the sponsor is. I know we're, we send a team every year, but I apologize that I don't know much more than that. But I do know in talking to the faculty advisor that the skill set for an ethics competition is just more what we would call qualitative skills. Uh, mm -hmm. The CFA competition is 
you know, you could argue it's a mix, but fundamentally it's a technical challenge, right? It's valuing a, comp uh, a company. So different types of students, depending on what they perceive as their strengths, are going to be attracted to those two paths. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'd like to just briefly open this up to all the students and please tell me if you've thought about any other challenges uh, that are out there. Uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, give me the name and if you um, have seriously considered anything else. At the uh, Daniels Business School, we always have a team that does the racing case, but I'm a terrible skier, so I can't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a part of that racing case. I'm a terrible skier, too. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> what other competitions are out there? All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and um, slightly different twist. Van, I want to ask you this question because we've talked about this before. Um, are these different competitions Let's talk about the research challenge in particular. How much time do students put into the research challenge? <laughs> All of it. <laughs> no, uh, it varies tremendously. I, I think it, it has to do with the personality of each student and each team. But we had someone two years ago who the dynamic on that team was they seemed to enjoy pulling all-nighters and locking themselves in a room. And one of them had a bit of an engineering background and claimed that they had put in over 800 hours working on it. I mean, that's, that's a full-time job. So, and at the other extreme, I remember one year, someone who was a very efficient worker and I think went on to work at Goldman Sachs said approximately 100 hours spread out over, you know, the four or five months. So the, the, the amount of effort and the efficiency with which they put it in is, it's a very individual um, answer for everyone. So. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a interesting way of thinking about it. Uh, it is individual. What about at the advisor level, um, Greg or Matt, when you're talking to the students, how much time do you think they've been putting into this? I can go first. I purposely don't tell them how much work will be involved so that I can get a team fielded. So I let them discover that on their own. Um, in terms of work, I think that competition brings out the best in people. So, you know, they, they do have a winter break and a lot of analysis can occur then. What I find is it's self-perpetuating. If you want to show up and you want to do a good job, you're going to, you're going to put in the time. And the, I think the role of the faculty advisor and the mentor is the same, which is to keep pushing them a little deeper down the rabbit hole, which is, have you thought about this? Why would this be the case? And then it naturally evolves that, you know, they don't want to embarrass themselves. They put in the work and, you know, they do a great job. All the teams do a great job because the, the type of people attracted to this are motivated to deliver quality product. Y'all second that, right? I mean, everyone... It's, it's a stressful situation to publicly speak if it's from your basement to your laptop or in front of, in, in front of a room, in front of an audience, right? So you don't wanna mess up and you, you wanna do a good job. So you put in the effort. And I think also, you know, it, it focuses the skills of working together, right? As a team and there's different components to the case. You know, putting a report is different than putting a presentation together. and managing how you're going to handle the Q&A and, and the transition between, between speakers. So there's so many different areas. And I would, I guess when Van was saying it's somewhere between 100 and 800 hours, I would, I would also agree with that. Depends on the team, depends on the people involved. And um, given COVID, that's, that's another uh, ingredient into the mix. And um, does it help? Does it hurt? You know, being able to work together remotely on a Google Doc versus sitting around a table. I mean, so many factors go into it. Mm, yeah, uh, certainly. Uh, this year has been very different. Uh, in general, would you, would you think that this is affecting their academic performance? The students who are working at this, if you can judge, I know it's a small sample, but how does it affect the work that they do in the classroom? You can see their grades, perhaps. Uh, maybe they're in this, your, your class as well. Or if not, what's your, uh, what's your expectation? 
I'll go first so I can deftly dodge this question and just say it's been a struggle uh, talking to students. You know, it's it's depressing having to stay away, right? Especially at a school like like CU Boulder and, and DU and I'm not as familiar with UCCS, but campus life is such a big part of it. And so it's it's a struggle, right? Everyone's dealing with it. And so it's, it's a universal struggle, but yet it's an individual one. And um, it impacts, it impacts everyone. And so, you know, I think we're all playing therapists, right? To some degree with our students and helping them navigate all this uncertainty. Van or Greg, what's your experience been with the, the students this year? I take it you haven't been meeting with them as much in person as you, you're used to. Uh, no, not for me. Never in person. Uh, it was all online, uh, which is a very different dynamic. And you know, I really have to salute everyone for persevering through it. And in some ways, it's probably a benefit. You know, it's very efficient. Um, it it does take away some of the recruiting capability. I mean, it's a lot more fun to get together in person, and then the you know the each year new students hear the stories from, you know, the fun stuff that happened in the prior year. And that, they don't just hear about the suffering and the long hours, they hear about, you know, the stuff that was fun and the, 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 the team dynamic where it worked well. Um, you know, many students from prior years, I think are still pretty tight with one another because of the, you know, the, I mean, they live together on this project for, for so long, they, they become quite close. Yeah, that's certainly. Greg, how about you? What are your thoughts on this idea of what it's been like? Um, what is the, what is this research challenge meant in terms of their academic performance or just what in terms of this, uh, this unique year has, has, how's that affected the academic performance? Um, Look, I, I think it's been stated. It, it's been very difficult for everybody, um, not just because not all students respond to online learning. Um, it's easier to get distracted, uh, you know, than it would be in a classroom. But as you know, as Van and, and Matt pointed out, you lose the camaraderie, right? Like part of part of this is you get a camaraderie, and all of that, all of that has been much, much, much harder. Um, you know, that makes learning more difficult, that makes more effort by students and by professors. Um, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I think some of the learning has suffered a little bit, right? Because I can certainly compare exam scores from two years ago to today. I give a huge compliment to all the students who've gone through it. I think it's been hard for them. Hopefully they've made it and then this is just a chapter, you know, in the past, but it, it's been tough for the CFA challenge ditto, right? A big part of it is, is at least in years past, is getting together in a room and, and hashing out the issues and all of that's been lost. So it's been tough, you know, for those of us who have kids, we've watched it as well. It's, it's tough on everyone. So it's a year to be forgotten, I hope. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, let's talk about the future then. Um, what makes the research challenge relevant for future competitors? You've seen some years. Uh, now you know that at some point in the future, we're going to be doing something different, perhaps. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities and, and options now, too. So where would, where would you recommend the research challenge um, goes in the future? How do we do it differently? And this could be a, a, for any of you. If you've got an idea about what can make either the local or the, 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 um, the entire institute version of research challenge better or different in some way or how is it going to impact us how are we going to do it differently in the future if you were to bring up your crystal ball and that's such a, a that's a long topic you open up um, with a lot of perspectives but one plus i would say about the way it was done this year uh, most of the practitioners that i know we all pretty much work alone so you know i mean it, it What's unique for the students is they're doing it as a team project for the first time and being able to do so in person certainly has a lot of benefits, but, you know, the average analyst probably sits and reads for about eight hours a day and they don't interact with a lot of people. Um, 
certainly you do if you're interviewing management or attending a conference, but it's a this can be a very solitary type of work. Uh, and you become so efficient at it that I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't want to work as a team. And I I will say that even more strongly. The firms I've worked at where you have to work as a team, I I probably have seen more downside to that than upside. Certainly you get pushback, but to me, investing isn't a isn't a team sport. You know, we I I don't make decisions by committee, you know, and that and that's the appeal of this to me. I do my own damn homework, I put my own capital at risk, and it's a meritocracy after that with a little bit of luck. So if if you can learn to do this in the in the way that we did it this year, that probably will serve you well in your career. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I hadn't thought about that, but uh, that team dynamic is, is it definitely changes. Um, people are in, um, in thinking about this, is it possible that students are less influenced by each other when they're not directly in front of each other in the same room? And is that influence for good or bad? Anybody, anybody have thoughts about that? Um, because there's groupthink as is an issue in research analysis, isn't it? I mean, I, I throw that to the students, like, did you, you know, and everyone can just sort of raise your hand, you don't have to chime in, but if you think your team was successful at challenging each other and having vigorous debate, you know, wave your hand. And if you think maybe you, you would have liked to have been in a room where you can throw things at each other, <laughs> then that's a different answer. You know, I think I think it's uh, the the they come across different communication troubles. I mean, it's it's one thing to you know have the nerve to stand up to a bully, you know, around the table, and it's 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 different to it's well. Let me say this: it's easier to hide behind an email or a text and not respond, and to just kind of fade away like that, where your your presence is more difficult to, to uh, make clear, you know, in this, in this world. And I, I think I won't speak just for the C Boulder team, but just in general, right? I mean, it's, we all know it. The emails have increased the calendars. If it's not on my calendar, I'm not going to it because it doesn't exist to me at this point in time. You talked to me a year ago, it's a very different answer. And so it just poses, poses different, different issues. And then when it comes to the, the future of the case competition for the CFA, you know, we'd, be, we'd all be interested to know if, if you would like to have multiple teams from each school and if that's going to be a reoccurring theme and perhaps we can do a, a, a smaller version of maybe just the pitch or just the report internally and kind of weed it, weed it down within each university. And then this presentation is the step up. It's the level one where we know all the teams have competed internally at this lower level. And now even, I realize this is a regional, a sub-regional portion, but even then it has that kind of component of a higher level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, that is, uh, and, and let me just, this is, this is a very interesting question. And I'm gonna just wrap it up with this particular question for all the team members. Um, when you think about it, you realize that if you were to, if we were to have two teams from your university come and present here, uh, that would be uh, quite a bit of a different dynamic because we would have multiple teams, obviously. Um, would you be interested in competing against somebody from your same university, either on the higher level, like this level, or would you rather do it at the school level? And so I'd like to just open it up. Please go ahead and um, chime in, each of you go through it. Tell me, would you rather do it at the local level here or at your school level to have that competition? I think that I would rather have it at this level just because I feel like some of your peers at school would be able to kind of motivate each other a little more and that you and your team would kind of just be trying to outwork the other team in a way. But 
that's just my opinion. Yeah. Thank you, Mason. Who else? I, I would disagree with Mason and say, I think it might be better at the school level, just because then you're also competing like to get that um, exposure and to, you know, put that, you know, that you won the competition or something um, on your resume. So it could be another driver of uh, um, ambition or something to reach the next level of this competition. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. I say bring on the competitors at this level, you know, let's have some fun over here. All right, thank you, Kyle. Anybody else? Because we've got some results coming up here pretty soon. Can so I, won't can I just that, keep you waiting? Peter, Go for it. Hey, Peter, Peter, can I just lob one thing in, just offering the perspective of many years of participation? Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, to me, like the presentations I saw this year, these are the best ones I've seen, I think. And they, they really illustrate what we try to tell the students from day one is that there is not a right answer here. The market has a different price every day. So what's up with that? You know, if, it, if there was a right answer, the price would not change day to day. And so I, this was an ideal outcome where you have three strong presentations with three very different perspectives and nobody is wrong here, absolutely not. And if you were to put capital to work based on each one of these recommendations, obviously one scenario would prove to be more rewarding, but even that doesn't mean that you were wrong because you know there are black swan events out there and sometimes you get lucky. You know, I, I saw somebody pitch Tesla in 2019 and everyone in the room hated the pitch. And look where it went and look where it has come back. You can't, people can argue about that company all day long and they always will, always will. But the, it's, it's do your homework, make, your, make a fact-based argument. And I think all three schools did exceptionally well this year. This was a really good result. Thank you very much. Van, we're going to wrap this up, and I'd like you to say another word here in a minute. Let me let you go last. Yeah, no, he ate about half of his. Bryce? He ate half the hummus. Hey, Bryce, you got the. Uh, um, you got uh, muted there or unmuted. All right, so uh, let me start down in UCCS. Um, any any last comments before uh, we let uh, we let you go? What else would you like to say to the students? Sorry, what would I like to say to the students? Sorry, yeah, as you're wrapping this up. Baby, Great job. Everybody make sure you're muted as well. Great job to all the teams. It's a ton of work. You don't realize it. It is certainly if you go, if you work under me, you don't realize it because I don't tell you, but you definitely don't realize how much work is coming. You did a marvelous job. This is going to really help you in your interview. It's a lot more powerful to say I represented my university in a, in a equity valuation competition than I was a barista at Starbucks. So you've done a marvelous job and you all deserve huge congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. How about from Boulder? Matt, what are yep. your, your last words? Yep, I, I would echo that, echo that and say that, uh, you know, it's, it's all in your story and there's no right or wrong answer. You have some good facts and a strong, compelling story and don't wilt under pressure. And if, if you, you know, hold your line wherever you make it and uh, you know, that usually serve you well, 60% of the time. <laughs> Very good, thank you. 60% is good enough in our business, as we know. All right, Van, you're next. Any last words? I think that covers it. Um... I'll just lob this out though that, and, and I think one team really stood out in this regard, but I, I'll end with a quote from Warren Buffett that analysts think companies make profits, companies make shoes. 
-hmm. So the advice to students going forward is master the business, master the industry. And that's what we say on the first day and we say it throughout the competition. Don't worry about the valuation, learn the business and learn the industry. So that's, that's my parting shot. Thank you so much, Van. Greg, Van, and Matt, we appreciate all three of you. Now I'm just gonna say a, one or two more brief things and then I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Greenberg who's, got, who's gonna announce the results. Every student is gonna be receiving uh, a small gift in, the, in, in their email shortly from us. And in addition, we're going to invite all of you to be student members for the next year in CFA Colorado. So as you go forward over the next 12 months, if there is an opportunity for you to attend an event, whether it's virtually or if we're doing it in person at some time later this year, you're gonna be invited to that event as well. So we look forward to having you get a chance to network with the 1500 plus members of the CFA Colorado Local Society. And we think it'll serve you well to have that connection as you move forward in your, in your career. As you know, you've all, all get a chance to post your videos or at least a resume. And uh, we expect that over time, that is the first step in networking. There'll be many opportunities more. So we welcome you as members, if you choose to join uh, for no cost over the next year. Now let me turn it over to Mark. Mark with the judges has, uh, has uh, gotten the results. Thank you, Peter. Um, so all the teams did a great job. Um, as was said, the scores were, uh, were very, very close. And, um, but, um, uh, you know, it was, you know, we do have, uh, we do have an answer here. Um, and in uh, uh, just looking where I've got it written here, in uh, third place was CU Boulder, in uh, second place, UC Colorado Springs, and in first place, Denver University. Congratulations to all of you guys. Uh, DU will be sent uh, trophies to their advisor and uh, be distributed to everybody and uh, they'll be advancing to the next round, which will be, you'll get an email the exact date in the next couple of weeks of the details once those are set by the CFA Institute. Uh, but we appreciate everybody's work, the students, the advisors, the mentors, the judges, uh, all of you who watch this can tell how hard the students worked, how much they learned. And um, I can promise you when you go on interviews, regardless of what you're doing, whether you want to be a securities analyst or something unrelated to this field, that you can talk about what you've learned because you always need to understand your own company and your competitors, no matter what, no matter what you're working in what field. So thank you very much to all of you. And teams will be sending you uh, the judges notes in the next couple of days. So to your advisors, so you can all see um, what the judges comments were for each of you on uh, your respective uh, presentations today. And with that, we will call it a night. Thank you again for attending the research challenge this virtual year. And we look forward to seeing as many of you as are well, it was like to come back and participate next year uh, to watch the next year's group of students. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.